Raccoon's back. War, peace, politics and protest. On this Remembrance Sunday, there's so much to ask. Cease fire now! Cease fire now! An almighty protest and a political tangle. Even cabinet ministers got caught up. There were ugly skirmishes from far-right demonstrators and more than 100 arrests. The main march was broadly peaceful, but there were arrests later on. And police are investigating hate crimes and anti-Semitism on display. Yet the Home Secretary is accused of stirring up the trouble, rising claims that she should quit. Did you forget your resignation letter, Home Secretary? Her fate is uncertain at this most fraught of times. As we remember the sacrifice of the fallen in past wars and grapple with the reality of conflict abroad. So our main question this morning, are politicians making divisions worse at home? As dignitaries gather at the Cenotaph, the Defence Secretary, Grant Shapps, has joined us. But as a new war rages in the Middle East, we'll hear from Israel's President Isaac Herzog. With the Home Secretary's job in the balance, the woman who wants her job for Labour, Yvette Cooper, is with us too. And what are you watching on TV? What are you seeing on your phone? We'll hear from the first time from Lord Grade, the boss of Ofcom, who sets the rules. And we'll pay a special visit to Whitehall on this poignant day before the clocks ring out at 11. I'm at the Cenotaph on Remembrance Sunday. Almost 10,000 people are getting ready to take part in the march past here later this morning, and I will be talking to some of them. Morning, morning on this special day. With me at the desk, the former cabinet minister, Nadine Dorries, whose long-awaited book exploded into Westminster this week. Shami Chakrabarti, Labour peer, legal brain and human rights activist. And Lord Kim Darragh, the former British ambassador to Washington and diplomat. And before we do anything else today, I want to show you live pictures of what is happening on Whitehall. The special BBC coverage of the solemn moment of national remembrance today. Sophie Rayworth and David Dimbleby will be on after us. We have an extended programme until 10.15 today. But it's all taking place in a very fraught political environment, as the front pages show. Most of them splash on yesterday's marches in London. The Sunday Times said there was hate, intolerance and arrests as thugs hijacked Armistice Day. The Sunday Telegraph quotes the Prime Minister, who said far-right thugs and Hamas sympathisers disrespect our heroes. The Mail on Sunday picks up on Michael Gove being caught up in one of the protests at London's Victoria Station, saying he was jostled and abused by a pro-Palestinian mob. But the Sunday Mirror highlights Suella Braverman's role in all of this, saying, sack her now. The Home Secretary, of course, who raised eyebrows this week, having suggested that the police had gone soft on some kinds of protest. Um, Nadine Dorries, firstly to you, you were in government for a long time. We all saw what happened yesterday. We've all seen what happened this week with this very tense debate about the police. How difficult do you think it's been for the government to handle it? What, what did you think when you saw the protest? Um, well, a first point of your question, how difficult it's been to handle it. It wouldn't have been difficult if there had been some kind of cohesive leadership shown within government. I think the fact that we had, you know, that the whole story about Suella's article not having been given approval, I find that almost impossible to believe, really? having served as a Secretary of State myself. But then you had a Prime Minister trying to ride a number of horses at any one time and to please everybody. And you can't do that when you're a Prime Minister and a leader. You have to show absolutely distinctive leadership. And I'm afraid that Rishi Sunak just failed in that. And I think a lot of the problems don't lie at Suella Braverman's door. Mm. They lie at the Prime Minister's door because he's the person in charge. Shaman, do you think that what Suella Braverman said this week has stirred it up? A lot of your colleagues in the Labour Party have actually pointed the finger directly at her. Is that fair? Um, it, it, it is, but I, like Nadine, I think the Prime Minister has to take some responsibility because even his language of saying, just in advance of this weekend, I will hold the Commissioner accountable. The Met Police boss. That, um, that is almost an invitation to um, 
to, to, to people to come and misbehave, knowing that they might see off the Met Commissioner if they do that. I think it was an interference with operational independence. Now, of course, the Home Secretary is the pantomime villain, and she's bad cop, but I don't think the Prime Minister can, can hide behind her um, m much longer, actually. And Sir Mark Rowley, I think, actually did a good job yesterday yeah. there were no major no major damage to property no damage no nobody was harmed um in any significant way and i think he actually it was okay he managed it managed okay but you know the point on michael gove in that i've got i've got to raise it what was michael gove doing in the middle of victoria station on a day when every other sensible politician would no. not want to make the police job any harder and would keep, I mean, was he drunk? What was he doing there he in the middle of Victoria? Well, no, I, 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 <laughs> I, to coin a phrase. But why was he there? What was, what judgment made him walk through Victoria Station? Well, Kim, as was a, that playing as, to the gallery? Well, as a, di a diplomat, a foreign diplomat, you know, you're not somebody who is going to play politics with all of this. Well, perhaps you feel like doing so <laughs> this morning, but looking from the outside, there's been a furious political debate in this country mm. about protests and the right to protest. How do you think it has been handled? Do you know, when I was National Security Advisor before going to Washington, I used to talk to the head of the Met Police, not every week, but, but quite often. And uh, if I had been talking to him last week, I would have said, if I were in your shoes, I would ask for a postponement, just because there has been so much political controversy about this that it's bound to bring the wrong sort of people, the Tommy Robbins of this world, out and there's going to be a level of trouble and it may get out of control. If I'd advised that, I, mean, I would have been wrong, because I, th I agree with the lady. I think he just about made the right judgment here. Um, and I think the police did a pretty good job in managing it. Could still have gone wrong with those, uh, those potential clashes between, uh, between um, uh, marchers and, mm -hmm. and right-wingers. But in the end, it happened, and I'm glad it did, because freedom of speech uh, principle also, was respected. So in that sense, um, I think it was, uh, it, you know, it was successful. Okay. I don't well, agree with what Sola Bradman said, though, and I, my mm -hmm. experience of the police, I do not recognise the description mm -hmm. of them as biased. Interesting. Well, we talked to Grant Chaps, the Defence Secretary, about that a little bit earlier this morning, after the Prime Minister had condemned the thuggery during yesterday's protests and the anti-Semitism on display during some of the march. This is what Grant Chaps had to say about what went wrong. Well, actually, I was at the uh, cenotaph yesterday, laying a reef, and to see um, here, actually, specifically, um, people disrupting proceedings is, is obviously distressing. We're all there to come together to remember the brave men and women. Uh, as it happens, uh, EDL had already said they were going there, um, so I'm not sure that one is connected to the other at all. It, the, the fact of the matter is there are people who, I'm afraid, don't really want to respect Remembrance uh, Weekend, uh, and um, it doesn't matter whether they're the far right EDL or uh, I'm afraid some of the protesters on the other side. It is not a respectful thing to do during Remembrance Weekend when we should all be there to remember the brave men and women and, who've laid down their lives for and, this country. And no one seeing the images of what happened, where a group of thugs descended on the centre staff, intent on causing trouble. Yeah. The police have been very clear. There were people mm. often involved in football hooliganism before who turned up looking for a fight. However, there has been widespread concern before this weekend that the kinds of sentiment that Suella Braverman, your colleague, was using would stir up precisely this kind of thing. And what's very interesting, I think, to a lot of people this morning is the police themselves, on the record, have implied that this was the case. I'd like to show everyone what the Met Police said late last night. They said there were unique circumstances with the backdrop of conflict in the Middle East. But look at this, following a week of intense debate about protest and policing, these all combined to increase community tensions. Now, if we do a bit of translate on that, that is the police implying very clearly that the Home Secretary's stirring up of this debate made things worse. So, look, uh, there was lots of debate in the week beforehand, quite rightly, we live in a democratic society, about whether on Remembrance Weekend, when you have both Armistice Day on the Saturday, and then, of course, uh, today itself, um, where, uh, once again, people will be back at the Cenotaph, whether this was the weekend to go out and protest, and whether that's going to protest for one cause or just turning up as, as thugs. N neither, I think, was particularly becoming for this weekend. And that's a perfectly, though, proper debate to have in a democratic society. There's reason, no reason not to have those um, discussions. 
I think it would have been better if people concentrated uh, on the remembrance part of this. It's quite, quite unsurprising there'd be a debate about, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people coming out for other means. But you say there it would have been better to focus on remembrance. Would it have been better then if Suella Braverman had not, as she did in the pages of the Times newspaper, without full sanction from number 10, suggested that the police don't always play fair? Well, look, I think it's, first of all, on the police, I think it's incredibly important that where people have breached the law, going around carrying banners with swastikas on them, for example, uh, uh, shouting from the... The, the river to the sea, which is clearly an anti-Semitic uh, trope, uh, that they arrest people and that they prosecute. I think that is very important. I think it's also true to say that the police are an incredibly difficult job to do. And I actually just want to pay tribute to uh, their work yesterday in policing what's a very, very complex uh, picture, particularly in London. The, and to answer the, your question directly, which I'll come to now, to answer your question directly, as others in Cabinet have said, I wouldn't use the, that set of words uh, myself. But I do think that the sentiment that it's very important not just to take action, but also to get the prosecutions uh, and, uh, you know, essentially ensure that people don't feel that they can do these things, say these things, wave these banners around, uh, sometimes supporting prescribed organisations, as in Hamas, but the police... without sanction is also very important. But the police have said that the debate, which was prompted by your colleague, Suella Braverman, and you've just said you wouldn't have said what she had said. No, I wouldn't have used those words. Uh, I think the, the point yeah, so about... You, so you and many colleagues have distanced yourself from those remarks. And the police have said that the debate increased tensions in the community. It's pretty remarkable, isn't it, where you have the police and other people sitting alongside the Home Secretary and Cabinet basically pointing the finger and saying she shouldn't have said what she said, and also it made things worse. And Conservatives have said this, this too. You, one of your colleagues, a minister, Paul Scully, suggested that she had been fueling hatred and division. I'm saying that I do think it's very important that the police act quickly. I think there have been concerns sometimes that people um, have felt at liberty. Let, let me just finish this one thought, if I may. At liberty, uh, perhaps because they haven't seen swift enough action to carry on going out, carrying these banners, singing these, these chants and breaking uh, laws which were in place but to I'm prevent a... racial hatred. On the other hand, I wouldn't put it in those particular set of words because I recognise the police have a very difficult job to do uh, in you know, managing marches which contain large it, numbers of people. A lot of that work has to be done but it, afterwards. But it does sound though that you are rather blaming the police for not having and always being quick enough to clamp down on this kind of thing. The problem with not acting swiftly enough is you don't end up uh, with people experiencing the consequences of breaking the law. Again, we saw yesterday on that, uh, on that large march um, people uh, chanting, um, carrying banners, which are designed to stir up racial hatred, which are designed to support a terrorist organisation. It's very important to crack down on that. At the same time, as I say, I don't, I'm not blaming the police, in fact, because I think they have an incredibly difficult job to do. And you're trying to you know, do two things here. You're praising the police for doing a difficult job, but also, clearly, you are saying that they haven't always been tough enough on this kind of thing at protest. Does the Home Secretary, in your view, bear no responsibility for the disorder that we saw yesterday? Well, the people who, just to be absolutely clear, the people who bear entire responsibility, the thugs who turned up uh, in and around the Cenotaph area in Whitehall and then in Chinatown and, 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 and Soho but does and does the Home Secretary bear no and... responsibility for creating the climate? No, Are you I mean, disagreeing with what the police have said then? Yeah, look, I just think um, the police, I think, quite rightly refer to the debate in advance, which are largely around whether this weekend was an appropriate weekend to go out and, and protest, given... Which was stirred up given, by your colleague, given, Suella Braverman. Well, when you say stirred up, discussed by, yes, it's absolutely right to talk about it. We live in a democratic society. You know, it's perfectly proper to discuss whether this is an appropriate weekend to go and, in, and do and in, and in the way she discussed it, she also defied Downing Street by putting a, a published article into The Times without making all the edits that Downing Street had wanted her to make. Now, it's not really about that. It's about authority. She defied the orders of Downing Street. Should she be sacked? Because yeah, I, plenty of your colleagues have told me privately, not just that she should be sacked, but she might even be sacked tomorrow, or maybe she'll be sacked on Wednesday. Will Suella Braverman be Home Secretary by the end of the week? Well, first of all, I don't know the, the sort of ins and outs of the process of how an article uh, was, was published in this particular
uh, case. And secondly, as you'd absolutely expect me to say, the Prime Minister is in charge of whoever he, whomever he wants uh, in, in his cabinet, and he will make that decision whenever he wants to reshuffle, whether he does want to reshuffle his cabinet. I don't come with, with, with new news on that front. But it would be easier for you as a cabinet colleague not to have to always go around cleaning up controversies that have been caused by your colleague Suella Bravo, no, because it's not the first time, is it? Look, I just don't. I just don't see things um, that way. Um, we we live in a society where people are free to debate issues. Not all of us are going to agree all the time. But the principle everything of that is government, said. the principle of cabinet government, is discipline. It's mm. that you stick together. It's not that you have cabinet ministers going around the place, um, as some of your colleagues see it as shooting their mouth off, stirring up headlines for themselves day after day. You know, this isn't just a kind of isolated incident. Lots of your colleagues have had enough of Suella Braverman behaving as she does. And for as long as this goes on, doesn't the Prime Minister risk looking a bit weak, like he just can't do anything about it because he doesn't have the power? Well, I, I, know, I know it's always kind of quite tempting to sort of personalise this about one individual. Well, it's the um, Home Secretary. It's not just some random no, no, person. Sure. But, sure. But what we then get into is, well, would you have used this word or would you have phrased it or written it in an article like that? This is, this is the minutiae. The big picture is actually this government is clear in its stance against terrorism. And uh, for that matter, uh, the, the idea that people should not be able to go onto British street, streets and ideally not this weekend of all weekends mm -hmm. and, and in some cases promote those terrorists. Well, we will see what the next couple of days bring because I think words do matter and it does matter very much who sits around the cabinet table. Just finally, um, we are also speaking to President Herzog of Israel in a few minutes time on the programme this morning. But some of Israel's allies, like France, like the United States, are starting to express concern about the extent of the response. Do you think Israel has gone too far in its response to the horror of what happened? Our President Macron even said it should stop, there should be a ceasefire. Does the UK believe that Israel is acting proportionately? The UK believes strongly that Israel must act within international humanitarian law. It's not my question. Law. Do you believe Israel is acting proportionately? And secondly, I've seen and actually read on the BBC uh, in particular very detailed accounts of how Israel military leaders have called up people and asked for their assistance in ensuring that civilians in Gaza are moved before they go after Hamas terrorists. I think it's kind of, re we've sort of forgotten that in war, very sadly, people lose their lives. When Britain bombed Dresden, 35,000 people have apparently lost their lives. People die in war. When you have an organization like Hamas hiding and shielding themselves with and under the civilian population, it's a sad fact that some people will but lose their lives. You can see, though, that some of Israel's allies, like the US, like France, are uneasy with the scale of that response. That's not to say no civilians are going to be caught up in this. Yeah. That is the sad reality of what people see happening right now. But do you believe, I ask again, what Israel is doing is proportionate? I think Israel obviously is in a difficult place because when they go after the terrorists, some civilians are getting caught up. No one wants to see a civilian life. It doesn't matter if it's an Israeli or somebody from Gaza uh, taken. However, if Britain had been uh, subject to an attack of terrorists coming in, murdering 1,400 people, cutting off heads, we would not, and we knew where those terrorists had gone, no one would be saying to Britain, well, just stop going after them, even though, you know, those tunnels, those, those caves that they operate from, where all of those tens of thousands of rockets are being stored, how can we ask Israel not to go and destroy those bunkers? Uh, and unfortunately in war, you end up in a situation where other people get caught up in it. The answer is for Hamas to stop using those people as human shields and, by the way, release the over 200 hostages they have, some of whom are Brits. And so we should absolutely be on the side of right, and right in this case is going after Hamas. Can you tell us anything about the British hostages you mentioned there? Uh, only that we are working our socks off to try to get them uh, released, working very uh, closely in ways I, I can't um, go into on, on, on TV. Uh, and I'm arranging to speak to uh, the families of, of, of some of the British uh, hostages as well. Um, and I, our thoughts are with those who are being held uh, well over 200 every single day. Um, they've been, I think, in some ways forgotten in this conflict. It's where it started, and the wrong is entirely on Hannes' side for keeping them hostage at this time. Okay. Defence Secretary, thank you very much for coming in. We must let you get off to the service at the Cenotaph. Thanks thank very much indeed for coming in.
Well, what did you think of what Mr. Shapps had to say? Let us know. You can email us at kunzberg at bbc.co.uk or on social media. If you're that way inclined, use the hashtag. And there's always tons going on on the BBC website as we are on air too. Now, however many people were on the streets here and in capitals around the world yesterday, Israel's bombardment of Gaza goes on. This weekend, surgeons at the largest hospital there, Al-Shifa, claim the intensive care unit was hit and that the facility has run out of water, food and electricity. But with Israel's allies calling for more caution, how long can this retaliation for the appalling October the 7th attacks really go on? Early this morning, I asked Israel's president what those Hamas attacks that day had changed. We are extremely agonized. We are a nation which is an optimistic nation. We are a peace-loving nation and we strive for the inclusion of our nation in the region as such. And we have a nation that have contributed and will always contribute to the well-being of humanity. And all of a sudden, our world was shattered because many of our beliefs in the fact that we can live side by side with uh, Palestinian neighbors were shattered. In, the, in that morning, the most uh, horrific atrocities since World War II took place. And the, 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 many of the casualties were the biggest proponents and supporters of peace ever in the history of Israel. And they were all butchered and chopped and killed and abducted and raped. And the uh, uh, amount of pain and suffering and the horrific information that flows ever since because Hamas had filmed it all and broadcasted it all live and also afterwards on their cameras, on, the, on their bodies, is unending, unending. And you know, today's Armistice Day. Armistice Day in the United Kingdom, for me, is always a special day because my late father, Chaim Herzog, who was a high-ranking British officer in World War II, who landed in Normandy and liberated Belgium and, and, and Holland and went all the way to Bergen-Belsen concentration camp as one of the first officers to enter that hell, hell, place of hell. And until today, I meet survivors from that camp. So today is Armistice Day, and on that day and on this weekend, you have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of people supporting by their demonstrations, supporting Hamas. I want to show you something exclusive, Laura. So this is Adolf Hitler's book, translated to Arabic, Mein Kampf. It's the book that led to the Holocaust and the book that led to World War II. This is the book that led to his victory in elections in, in Germany, which led to the worst atrocity of humankind, which the British fought against. Well, this book was found just a few days ago in northern Gaza in a, in a children's living room, which was turned into a military operation base of Hamas on, one of the, on the body of one of the uh, terrorists and murderers of Hamas. And he even marked, he wrote notes, he marked, he marked and, le and learned and learned again and again Adolf Hitler's ideology of hating the Jews, of killing the Jews, of burning the Jews, of slaughtering the Jews. This is the real warrior act. So all those who demonstrated yesterday, I'm not saying that all of them support Hitler, but all I'm saying is by, by omitting to understand what Hamas ideology is all about, they're basically supporting this ideology. There will be many people who were on the streets, though not just in London, but in other capitals around the world, who are on the streets because they want to see an end to the violence in the Middle East. Now, viewers will hear the hurt and agony that you have expressed that Israelis have felt, but your allies, many of the people who back Israel, believe that the extent of your response has now gone too far. President Macron has called for a ceasefire. He said Israel is killing babies and it needs to stop. The Secretary of State of the United States, Antony Blinken, has said too many Palestinians are being killed. Isn't it time, President Herzog, that you listen to your allies, notwithstanding that terrible pain of your countrymen? So first of all, we of course we listen to our allies, but first and foremost we defend ourselves. And President Macron already last night and even today in an article in Le Parisien actually 
corrected the image that came out of that interview because, of course, he made it clear Israel has no, does not intentionally kill civilians, children, and, and, and innocent people. God forbid we don't. We but, operate but according, Herzog, exactly according to... Wait, clearly, wait, Laura, you have to enable. We, 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 were, we work exactly according to the rules of international humanitarian law. We alert each and every civilian because their homes have become terror bases. Please go out. We send them leaflets, we call them, we phone them, we text them. We enable them to go down. We give them humanitarian uh, pauses so that they can go down. Unfortunately, there are tragedies. We don't shy away from them. But truly, many of the tragedies are done by Hamas, like they bombed Shifa Hospital yesterday, not Israel. And we can go on and on by explaining this. But one thing is clear. We need to eradicate that terror machine. We need to eradicate this ISIS, Hamas, Hitler ideology. This is the truth. Otherwise, you won't have peace in the Middle East. And believe me, I'm a huge supporter of peace in the Middle East all my life. But unfortunately, so long as there is terror, nobody can indirectly or directly support terror because that's the reason that we're at war. But you say there that al-Shifa was bombed by, not by Israel, but there are reports there on the ground of babies dying in the neonatal unit after power to their incubators was cut off. You say that Gazans have been told to that leave. That is not They've true. Given... By the way, it's, it's not true. Well, we, we, will, we will try through all. the day. There to... is a lot of spin by Hamas. There's a lot of spin by Hamas, but... There is electricity in Shifa. Everything is operating. We're speaking to the managers. We haven't gone into Shifa. We're unfortunately underneath Shifa. There's a huge, huge terror base. Actually, the headquarters, the headquarters of Hamas ISIS operations is right there under Shifa. Now, exactly what are we supposed to do? Leave it as is and then in a few years' time go again through the same motion and you will say it's inproportionate and we will have civilians being killed. So we are calling on all of the, those uninvolved to go out to another hospital nearby and we're coordinating it very delicately with all forces around that Well, the, the World Health Organization this morning has said they've lost communications with that hospital and there are reports from doctors there on the ground about a terrible situation and our viewers there can see the images from Gaza that many, many people have not been able to leave. They have not been able to escape. But you mentioned there, President because Herzog, Hamas is what may them. happen next. Hamas sh is stopping we're them. We're short of Hamas time. Hamas is blocking them. And I would like to move on to what happens next. Because for decades, there has been conflict in your part of the world. And there has never been a military solution. So what is Israel's end game? How do you bring this to an end? President Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu has said Israel will take security responsibility for Gaza for an indefinite period. That sounds like a full-on occupation. Is that your plan? So let me explain to you and just remind your viewers that we've, we've actually tested all options. We've had peace treaties. We've had agreements. We had a unilateral pullout from Gaza itself in 2005. We took off everybody. We left to the last inch. Unfortunately, we got terror because the Iranian supported Hamas, had a coup d'etat in 2007. They kicked out the Palestinian Authority, which is another example of failure of the Palestinians to adhere to the agreement. So what and is their the solution forces, now? Then we have ten, wait, we had tens of thousands of missiles. So the real is, there is a real question. How we, do we get to peace? And you know what the real answer is? First, stop terror. Terror is what derailed all peace agreements in the region. Terror is, why, what is, is the aim. The aim of terror is to derail the current agreements and the inclusion of Israel and the normalization with its Arab neighbors. But I, I'm actually hopeful because I believe the train has left the station. And I'm adamantly believing in the fact that we can get to peace. But we can get to peace if people adhere to the agreements and don't revert to terror. But atrocious terror, like the one we've seen, which the world hasn't seen since World War II, must be eradicated completely so that we can give hope to our neighbors, the Palestinians. But President Herzog, 
do you accept that Israel's own activities in the West Bank have fueled Palestinian anger, that what has been happening over the last few years has been part of the problem stoking feelings up? I can go on and on about that. You know why? Because when there was the, uh, the agreements, the Oslo Accords, it's, th there was suicide bombers for years and years that simply derailed any ability to get to peace and, and, and forced us to use much more military means. Unfortunately, the Palestinian Authority has failed time and again in combating terror from its own courtyard. And you know why? Because part of their education system is filled with hate, with prejudice, with curses, with all sorts of uh, information which is totally distorted against what Jews are, what Israel is all about, including this type of stuff, which this and ISIS material, which we find all over Gaza in their own schools, where we find in those schools bombs and grenades and missiles in schools and mosques. So part of the real gist of why it failed so far is the education of the people, something which Israel has alerted time and again, and the fact that terror was becoming legitimate in some quarters of Palestinian society. This is what we have to work on, par par parallel to the ability to sit down and speak and find ways and means towards a better future in the future. President Herzog, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you very much. Israel's president, and it is always hard to sort claim from counterclaim in the middle of any conflict. But the BBC, and particularly our teams on the ground, will always try to get to the truth and establish exactly what has been going on. Um, Kim Darek is a former very senior diplomat. Listening to that, do you think that Israel is concerned at all about losing the support of its allies? We've heard from President Macron, we've heard from Secretary of State Blinken for the United States suggesting they are going too far. Do you think the picture is changing? I think it is shifting a bit. I think that up to a point, Israel does care about what the West is saying, cares in particular about what America is saying. So messages coming out of Europe have less impact there than whatever the United States is saying. But in the end, the Israelis don't trust anyone with their own security other than themselves. I think that in private, the Americans in particular, maybe us too, there have been some quite tough messages to the Israeli government about uh, need for humanitarian pauses, which have sort of started, although only briefly each day, and about the need to minimize civilian casualties. As the death toll mounts in Gaza, those messages, I believe, in private, getting tougher. Mm. We've even had a glimpse of Tony Blinken saying something more publicly about this. So the pressure on them is mounting. And every day that this offensive, this ground operation in Gaza City continues, I think a little bit of, of Western public support, media support, and maybe political support ebbs away. But in the end, the Israelis will ultimately take their own decision about what they need for their security. But you've also got to consider, um, and I, I agree with that, you have to consider a domestic opinion in Israel itself. Mm -hmm. And people sometimes forget that just like Britain isn't a monolith mm -hmm. and we have differences of opinion about difficult subjects, the same will be true of, of, of Israelis. And one of the reasons why I really think that now, after over a month, it's time to mm. look towards ceasefire, is the hostages are not free. Mm. The and Israeli hostages. The Israeli hostages are probably in the mm. tunnels. And, you know, and the longer this goes on, with, with, with general bombardment, rather than some attempt at either negotiation or extraction, you know, those remaining hostages, which, ought, which many Israelis think should be the priority mm. for, um, for the government. I think longer term, I, personally, I found Mr. Mac President Macron very compelling mm -hmm. in his interview, and not just on this subject, on, but on other mm. uh, topics too. But, but I also think this is going to become counterproductive to Israelis' own long-term uh, peace and security because I, with respect to President Herzog in this very difficult time mm. for him and his people, I don't think Hamas is a machine as he described it. I think it's more like an organism.
and the danger is you cannot destroy that that mm. ideology with with bombs alone you in the end you're going to have to create an alternative and some hope so that you can um, so that people do not become recruited to the cause future generations and don't become recruited to the and Nadine, I'll come cause. to you in a second about what the UK government should be doing but came as a former diplomat you know if you were looking at this now on paper and thinking what could be a solution what could it be is there any prospect of a political solution anytime soon Probably not any time soon if we're talking about days or even weeks. I think this Israeli ground offensive, this ground operation, is likely to carry on for a few weeks yet. I think they're right getting to the right to the centre of Gaza City and they will want to, they want to go into the tunnels, they will want to eliminate um, Hamas uh, weapons stores and this kind of thing. But the striking thing for me about President Herzog's interview with you, Laura, is he ducked the question about what next. And there are two issues about what next. First of all, who runs Gaza when the military operation is finished? And second, long term, how do we restart? Uh, we can't go back through this again. There have been 10 wars in Israel since its foundation in 1948. This has to be the trigger to renew a process on a two-state solution. And how is that going to, going to start? Not, I suspect, with Netanyahu as, as Israel's prime minister. And of course, he's deeply unpopular at home. Um, Nadine, the UK government has been you know, sticking closely to its line all the way through. And we heard it again from Grant Shapps today that Israel has a right to defend. He was reluctant to echo um, Emmanuel Macron, even Tony Blinken, who've you know, had these notes of caution. Do you think the government's right to do that? I'll just go to what Kim said. The, the two-state solution is the way forward. That's, that's what our government should also be articulating. That's where we need to get, the place we need to get to. But of course, Hamas prevent that. They pre prevented us reaching that, that, that situation which has been desired in the region for, for many years now. But what we can't forget is that, you know, nobody wants to see, the Israelis don't want to bomb Palestinian civilians or to murder babies or for the Palestinian civilians to be the consequences of this these actions but by the same token you know that it, Hamas did cross the border and rape and murder in the most appalling way 1400 Israeli citizens how would we respond if that was us and I think from the government's response these two situations are very difficult very difficult to find an ameliorative solution to, to bring this together, but there has to be a way where the government articulates, yes, we back the Israeli state, of course we do, but yes, we should also be looking for peace in the region and for Palestinian and individuals it's, it's and the people. It, and to do that, the only way we can do it is to get to a two-state solution. It's difficult for the Labour Party as well, Shami. Um, now, yep. you're someone who's very much associated with the fight for human rights. There are parts, I suppose, in your segment of the Labour Party that have been very unhappy with Keir Starmer refusing calls for a ceasefire. He lost the front bencher this week over quit over his refusal to do so. But it's interesting when you talk to people in the party, one party source this week, it was reported, shrugged off the problems and the resignations, saying it was like shaking off the fleas. Now, what did you feel when you heard that? Well, that particular piece of briefing, I mean, and of course, Nadine's written a book about off-the-record briefings. I'm going to and, talk about that in a second, it, yeah. But it's not just in your party, if I may say that. Um, to use that phrase, um, particularly when um, so many, not all, but so many of the people who have been very upset about the bombardment of Gaza are British Muslims, including members of the party and voters for the party and councillors. To, to use that phrase is very inflammatory and, and arguably racist. And, and if that was briefed out by a press officer or somebody else working for the party, they should be disciplined. Do you think that the leadership should hunt out what happened there? I think that that particular phrase has been has, has caused a, a, a great deal of, of hurt and concern. And we're, to, and we're worried about racism and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and things that happen over there spilling onto into communities over here. We certainly don't need briefing like that from anybody working for the Labour Party. We'll see what happens in the coming days and it'll be interesting to see if the leadership has anything to say about this. Now, Nadine, also in the background of all of this, as we touched on at the beginning of the programme, is unhappiness in the Tory party about the Home Secretary's behaviour. Um, do you think Suella Braverman should be sacked? Gosh, look, there's one overriding concern I have over the reaction to Suella Braverman. I've already said I absolutely do not believe that her article, which is at the root of all of this, went into the Times newspaper and was not approved by it. I just don't believe that. So I think that's, you know, part of the, the briefing machine that goes out. But you know, what, what we what I've seen with Suella is, and I saw it with Pretty Patel, and I see it with any woman who reaches high office, 
is this backlash which has to be and is steeped in both misogyny and sexism. It's rife both in politics and I'm sad to say in the media too. Think she's I experienced it just for writing a book, you know, I experienced it when I was Secretary of State. Should Suella be sacked? No, she shouldn't. Because actually the person who is responsible, as I've said, is the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. He needs to own the problems which are taking place mm -hmm. as a result, supposedly, of her article in The mm -hmm. Times. If number 10 did not take control of that, and I think it points to a deeper problem in Downing Street at the moment, and that is a weakness. They, 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 they don't know what each other is doing, you know, what, what the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. And an absolute weakness in the Prime Minister's office himself. He but can't this, decide on a straight line that he's going to put out, either over the protest or on what's, going, what's happening mm -hmm. in Gaza. He can't decide on a straight line. But there's no surprise that you might say that as one of Boris Johnson's most ardent supporters. And in your book, The Plot, you make... A, a significant list of claims about how Boris Johnson was somehow undermined by people who'd been out to get him from the very beginning. Isn't it actually just the case that he got caught out? He had a very tricky relationship with being able to tell the truth. He made lots of mistakes. And in the end, MPs in his party looked at him and thought, you're doing us more damage than gain. Time to go. So first of all, when you say it's, it's I've written it, it's, it's not me. So this book well, it's is your book based on conversations. It's with my lots of book, people. but it's actually directly translated conversations with former prime ministers, home secretaries, chancellors, senior civil servants. It's not actually my my take on the situation. It's that of other people. It's a very good read. <laughs> I couldn't put it down. read it as a reviewer yeah. for us. It's more Thank like, you, yeah. Shami. <laughs> this puts a light on well. But yeah, so um, so no, you know, and, and, and honestly, I think you. I, I would say to anybody read the book because it says in very clear detail how we got to that situation of Boris Johnson being moved, who the key players were, what they did, and as Shami just said, the briefings, you know, who runs the media output, what briefings do they put out there, how do they make those stories run in the press, just how is public perception controlled, okay. that's what it's about. Okay, and Kim Dash, just before we finally move on, as somebody who used to work at the highest levels of government as a civil servant, as an as advisor, when you see this kind of thing play out, these kind of soap operas, how damaging is it to the government's reputation? How much of a pain is it on your back when you're just trying to get things done? Um, oh, it's, it's damaging unquestionably. And if you look at the combination of um, the book, and I've, I've read the media stuff, but I haven't read the book yet, and the stuff that came out of the COVID inquiry, mm -hmm. which made the government look like look like the set of in the thick of it. Mm. Um, that I mean, that gets all the embassies in London pick it up, other governments know what's going on. Mm -hmm. It makes us look shambolic and it is damaging. So there's no question that it does us harm. Okay, all three of you, thank you so much. We'll be back with you towards the end of the show. Well, as we've heard, responding to events in the Middle East is not easy for either of our big political parties. Keir Starmer lost a front bencher this week, and there's a vote in the Commons in the coming days to demand a ceasefire that's being pushed by the SNP. That may, may, might make things more awkward for him in the coming days. Well, Yvette Cooper wants Suella Braverman's job to be Labour's next Home Secretary, and she joins us now from her Yorkshire constituency. Good morning. Now, Sadiq Khan, your colleague, the London Mayor, Good has morning, blamed Laura. Suella Braverman directly for the clashes at the protest yesterday. Is he right? Well, Remembrance should have been a weekend for everyone to come together. And we did see some appalling scenes in the capital yesterday, including the far-right, uh, thuggish, violent behaviour attacks on police officers of people trying to get to the cenotaph. And also, we saw some awful anti-Semitic uh, cases as well on, uh, that are still being investigated by the police. Uh, I think we should thank the police for the work they did to make sure that armistice wasn't disrupted. That was what they said they would do. But it is undoubtedly the case that the Home Secretary made the job of the police harder this weekend. She inflamed tensions. She also uh, attacked the police, undermined respect for the police at a really important time. That was highly irresponsible. It's just not the way any Home Secretary would do that job other than Suella Braverman. And Rishi Sunak is being so weak that he is allowing her to do that. It's very damaging. Should she be sacked then? She shouldn't carry on in this job. Clearly, he needs to take action to do this and uh, he, he needs to remove her. But to be honest, he also should not have appointed her to this job in the first place because 
recall that she was appointed five days after being sacked by Liz Truss for breaking the ministerial code. Uh, and I think it's also uh, the fact that we've had this effectively support for her position of undermining the police at such an important time, casting doubts on their impartiality, casting doubts on their operational independence, rather than working with them, you really need the Home Secretary to have credibility and authority on working with the police, uh, on helping make sure that communities are cohesive and calm, she doesn't have the authority or credibility to do that. There is an interesting broader principle though behind this, isn't there? You aspire to be the next Home Secretary if there is to be a Labour government. Home Secretaries have responsibility for policing and surely the police can't act with complete impunity. Doesn't the Home Secretary actually have a role from time to time to call them out if they believe they're going wrong? You're right that there has to be a framework for accountability and uh, there are processes to do that and certainly uh, when policing events happen, of course there will be questions asked afterwards about what should happen. There's also a responsibility on the Home Office to make sure that proper standards are in place for policing, proper procedures and approaches are in place for policing. But the operational independence is, it's a really deep rooted part of the British policing tradition, it goes an back, back example very many Cooper. generations. But there's an interesting example of it, Cooper, when the awful and sad case of Nicola Bully came up in Lancashire, I'm sure viewers will remember all of that. We spoke about what was going on at that time. You spoke then about the police's decision to release some of her private information and you expressed significant concern about that. Now that was an operational decision and you felt in that moment it was the right thing to be critical of the police. And it is right to ask questions about operational decisions that the police have made. But that's not what the Home Secretary was doing. And bear in mind, she's the Home Secretary. So she has the responsibility that is different from other members of Parliament and so on. She has the responsibility to work closely with them. And what she was doing was casting doubts, this blanket attack on their impartiality, on their ability to do the job. Now we know the police operate uh, without fear or favour. There will be all kinds of individual decisions that many of us may disagree with. There are also proper complaints processes that are in place around individual decisions as well. But this blanket attack on the impartiality of the police in the run-up to a very difficult weekend and also the decision to inflame tensions, to deliberately escalate the, and, and increase the temperature also in the run-up to Remembrance Weekend when the Home Secretary should have been playing a role to bring communities together to calm tensions, to call for respect for the remembrance, for the armistice. Actually, what she did was just highly irresponsible. There is a reason that no other Home Secretary would ever do that and has ever done that. And the events that we saw yesterday are that reason. There are lots of fraught conversations across politics at the moment. And some of those difficult conversations are also happening in the Labour Party. Many in your party want Keir Starmer to be saying there should be a ceasefire in the Middle East. And we've heard in the last few minutes, Yvette Cooper, the Labour peer, Shami Chakrabarti, suggests that some of the anonymous briefings from the leader's office bordered on being racist and were offensive. Now, the briefing she was referring to, in case you didn't hear, was to saying that resignations from the party on the issue of a ceasefire were just shaking off the fleas. Do you think that that briefing was racist and offensive? So my understanding is that did not come from anybody anywhere near the Labour leadership and that the party has made that uh, abundantly clear and I understand that that has been recognised and accepted. Clearly it's a totally disgraceful thing to say and that's why nobody uh, in the Labour leadership would have said it. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we shouldn't sort of perpetuate the, the misinformation about this. It is clearly disgraceful, but my understanding is it has nothing to do with the Labour leadership. And when it comes, though, to the vote in the next few days in the House of Commons, will Labour MPs, will Labour shadow ministers who want to vote for a ceasefire be disciplined if they vote against the leadership's position? 
So I think you're talking about possible votes that may take place around the King's speech. Just in, in terms of what the, the procedures are, I think there's around 15 amendments already that have been put down around the King's speech. There may be more and we don't yet know which amendments the Speaker will select um, or what the next steps will be. There's always then a process in which uh, the Labour Party and the Whip set out the response but at that point. But likely to be a so vote on a ceasefire I'm not going to in the Middle East that, of it, Cooper. You, will well, Labour MPs, you, will you're Labour front broader benches issue. be so let me address the broader, if they vote let, for a ceasefire? So let me address the broader issue because um, I can't preempt the, the processes around the Speaker selecting amendments and the way in which the party responds to amendments that are, have been set out and the different amendments that have been set out. But look, there is a, a wider issue here, which is the devastating things that are happening in the Middle East at the moment and the real uh, deep, deep concern and distress there is. We have seen 4,000 Palestinian children killed in Gaza. Hostages are still being held. There's obviously a humanitarian crisis at the moment. And I think that everyone wants to see an end to the violence and, and a proper uh, and measures to address the humanitarian crisis and that are in place. And we've talked about that at that great length on the, the programme this Labour morning, Party is but I'm asking you a specific to, to question. If there is a vote on a ceasefire in the House of Commons this week, will Keir Starmer sack front benchers who vote for a ceasefire, which is different to his own position? And I understand, and you asked me that question, Laura, and as I've said, I can't preempt the process that we will go through with the selection of amendments that hasn't yet taken place by the Speaker and the Labour Party will then set out very its elegant response way of avoiding to the, the amendments that um, are selected. But I, well, I'm trying to address the wider issue because, I, you know, I'm not, I can't answer the process question for you, but what I can do is to talk about the wider issue. Keir Starmer has obviously set out the, um, the position, the Labour Party's position, as part of the um, Chatham House speech that he made. You will have also heard uh, David Lammy and uh, Lisa Nandy call for much stronger humanitarian action, including civilian protection, because so many children's lives are being lost it is absolutely devastating what's happening and we've seen some of the the consequences too with the hospitals not having fuel it's why we've called for some kind of immediate suspension of hostilities to get the humanitarian pause in place there has been some progress but the short pauses are just not enough and we've got to have the space both to make sure that there can be the humanitarian aid but and the food and fuel but also to have the civilian protection measures put in place as well and Yvette space Cooper. too for further Never negotiations around on hostage the release Yvette as Cooper, well. We, we must leave it there but thank you for joining us this morning not least because I know you Thanks, have to Laura. dash off to your local remembrance service in your constituency there in Castleford. Now let's take you now to the scene of our national remembrance where for more than a hundred years veterans have been joined by members of the royal family, senior politicians and the military at the Cenotaph in Whitehall. Sophie Rayworth is there for us this morning. Good morning from the Cenotaph where almost 10,000 people are getting ready on Horse Guards Parade to come out here shortly and take their places on Whitehall ahead of this morning's march pass, young and old taking part, among them about a dozen World War II veterans, the youngest now in their late 90s. And you can see some of the members of the public who've been queuing since the early hours just to make sure that they get their places here so that they too can pay their respects. Well, I'm joined right now by two women, two sisters who served in the RAF, who are taking part in the march past this morning. Good morning, Michelle Razak and Sue Fisher. Good what does it mean to both of you to take part in the March Pass together? Um, it's remembering the people that have gone before us that have made it possible for us to do the jobs that we did within the Air Force. And it also is the camaraderie that we feel when we all meet up year on, year in. And the people that can't march because of disability or age, as well as the ones that have gone before. And so you joined as a, you were a nurse. That's and right, Michelle, yes. you were, you were pretty pioneering, weren't you? Because you joined a decade later in 1990, you were an aircraft engineer and there were very few women doing that. Yes, when mm. I joined up, I could count um, the ladies going through Cosford 
doing their trade training on one hand, but now it's opened up and there's so many young ladies going through and really carrying the banner for equal jobs, equal pay and uh, equal opportunities in the Air Force. What is it like when you take part in the March Pass? Because you've both done it now a few times, haven't you? Yeah. But it is a, it's a really charged moment, isn't it, for people? It is, isn't it? You can feel the emotion. Mm -hmm. Everybody stood there to attention, we march off, and just the, the swell of pride that you feel as you're going down, it does, mm -hmm. it does get to you. It, it, a lot of the ladies you'll see, they'll have a tear in their eyes that come past the cenotaph. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's just so important to be here, to remember everybody who's been before. It's also about connections, isn't it? A lot of the veterans over the years have said to me, this is the one day, the one moment... I know. ..when they can, they can be with people who they can just be completely open with. It's, it's like-minded, it's a different sense of humour that we have, um, and it's great. You meet new people, you meet people that you haven't seen for decades. It's not just years. In our case, it's decades. We haven't reconnected. But you meet them and it's as if you only said goodbye to them last week. It is fantastic. And is really that a huge support from the, the crowds who are growing right now I on know. Whitehall? Well, we'll let you go and get ready, but uh, thank, you, thank you both very much for joining us this morning. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. More of that later on BBC One. Now you remember, we've talked so much on this programme about the dangers and excitements of the world online. The government's finally brought in a huge new set of laws trying to put safety at the top of the list. The job has been given to Ofcom, the watchdog that for years has looked after what's on our screens. That was the chart, that was top of the pops. Ofcom's been checking what's on the box since the early noughties. Was the last number one of 2002. Their job since has been keeping an eye on this lot. You can track it, maybe not my... No, 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 no. See you later. Sorry, can't this do this. This is absolutely... And looking into complaints about when and where politicians pop up on screen. So why did you do it? Why did it? Yeah, why are you here? But now the regulators got to take on the wild west of the internet too. Good luck with that. Well, the man who's leading the charge as chair of Ofcom is Lord Michael Gray, who's here in the studio for the first time. Welcome to you. Now, one of the main aims of this huge new bit of legislation is to make sure that children are protected online, including from content that isn't illegal, but might be harmful. Now, this principle is at the core of it. So can you give us a brief sense of what that means? Well, the, the legal but harmful sections of the bill were removed during the parliamentary process. What we're concentrating on is, is reducing harm for children on, 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 online, which is about strangers being able to contact them. It's about uh, seeing stuff that they shouldn't be able to see and so on. So the, the, the big push is, is to reduce harm for children. And how on earth do you actually do that if stuff isn't straightforwardly against the law? Uh, well, we only deal with illegal. It, we, we only deal with illegal harms. Um, th that's the, the core of the bill. Uh, it's it's our job is to make sure that the tech companies themselves, the platforms themselves, take absolute control and and have systems and processes in place to stop it. And they will be held to account for that. We can't possibly control and monitor all the content as we're talking thousands of bits of stuff is is going on here we just got to reduce the harm and i think parents and uh, 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 anybody with children wants to see that happen there are some areas where the law is very clear but there are these gray areas and you've just said you know you can't possibly get to everything so i would like to show you something that is seen online that's hugely popular this is a video of an online influencer called myron Gaines. now he hosts a dating and fitness podcast that's aimed at men but we know also that a lot of young people are seeing this kind of content let's have a look if i arm you guys with the tools that you need so you can deal with these modern day women i'm happy with that because you know what i'd rather be called the misogynist i'd rather that Right? Be called names, then one of you guys killing yourself over some. Now that's deeply Ugh. offensive to many people. It's horrible. You're then making a face. Yes. Listening to that. The Myron Gaines tag on TikTok has over half a billion views. Now, with the new powers that you have, can you tell parents this morning that their kids aren't going to see that? That's not going to pop up on their phones? I sincerely hope so, yes. It'll be down to us to uh, lean on the tech companies, for the tech companies themselves to take responsibility for stuff like that. Children should not be seeing that. That is so grossly misogynistic and, uh, and offensive. It, it shouldn't be there. So how will you stop it happening, though? Well, 
under the, under the uh, powers of the Act, we have the powers to go into these uh, tech companies and examine their algorithms, how they're, uh, how they're uh, uh, controlling the content. They have to take responsibility uh, for this kind of stuff, and it's, it's, that's clearly unacceptable. And, and they, will have to have, they will have to satisfy us and the law uh, that they're taking steps to stop horrible stuff like this. But what will that actually mean in practice? Because you're saying the tech companies will have to satisfy you, that they're doing enough to take it down. And if you are a parent of a kid who's been watching grim material on their phone, if you are the friend of somebody who's maybe suffers from anorexia, who's been looking at that kind of content on their phone, what can you actually do as an individual citizen? Phone Michael Grade, phone well, up no, Ofcom? We, we will make sure that the tech companies have got proper complaints procedures. It's very important that they understand the complaints that are coming in. So complaints will go uh, to the tech companies and they will again have to satisfy us that their complaints procedures are, are effective and that they are taking notice of the complaints. But in practice, what will that mean? Because ensuring a complaints process is effective, you know, are there time limits on how quickly they will have to take things down? How do they actually satisfy you that they're paying any attention? Uh, what will happen is that uh, when there's a, a horror, we will go in, we will talk to them, we will see what they've done about it. How quickly was it brought to their attention? How quickly did they act? What, did they act responsibly? Did they act in line with what the act requires of them? Uh, it's pretty, pretty serious. And, and the big tech companies are ready for this. They are certainly ready for it, and they've hired thousands of people to try to deal with all of these things. Will you force them to change the algorithms, so the formulas that decide not just what content is suggested to people, but also how often it's pushed the, and blasted at them, because it's not always absolutely. about the content, it's also about the frequency with which stuff gets pushed to people. For the first time, the Act gives us the power to go in and demand the, the background, the underlying information, the codes, the algorithms, everything else. We'll be able to get in and see what they're doing. But what we're trying to do is to get them to take, and what the Act is, expects of them and what we expect of them is to take responsibility for the harm that they cause or that is caused on their platforms. So what does that mean take responsibility for the harm that's caused? Through their risk assessments, uh, through the codes that we will that we will introduce, statutory codes, uh, through all the, the mechanisms that are in the Act that enable us to hold them to account. Do you think that people, particularly young people, get addicted to social media platforms? I think there is an addictive quality, yes, definitely. Uh, you know, I, I, you know we all, we're all, you know, we're, there are people watching this program now who are also <laughs> texting or, or WhatsApping or whatever they're doing. Um, that's an inevitable part uh, of, of the internet. But there are huge values in the internet as well. We mustn't lose sight of that. People have been concerned as well with hateful images and hate speech online, particularly right now with what's going on in the Middle East. Yeah, well, that's illegal. That, that they won't be allowed to do that anymore. But do you anticipate that you will crack down on platforms like X, formerly known as Twitter, for hosting that kind of material? If they allow, if they allow illegal content onto their services, they will, they will be in trouble, yes, definitely. And, and do you have concerns about how Elon Musk has run X since he took over? Uh, I don't have a view about Elon Musk. You don't have a view about Elon Musk? No, no, I've never met him. Uh, I, I don't have a view about him. They will have to ab abide by the regulations that are in place and that have been voted on by Parliament. Isn't this all, though, a bit like David and Goliath? You know, you've got these new powers, you've hired 350 people to work on this, but we know big platforms like Meta, X, huge companies like that, have got thousands and thousands and thousands of people working for them. Many of them fought against this legislation tooth and nail. Are you really confident that you're actually going to be able to make a difference? Yes, because we're not the only country regulating. Uh, they've got this issue with the European Commission, uh, with Brussels, so they've got this issue in Australia. They've got it that more and more countries are waking up to the fact that, that, they, that, that the days of the free-for-all are over. But in the end, these platforms have a reputation to ma maintain. Without that reputation, advertisers are not going to want their brands mm. on on their platform so th there's a lot for them to lose if they don't behave themselves so you say the days of the free-for-all on the internet are over some people in this country think on tv and particularly in news there's more of a free-for-all than there used to be as a neat segue <laughs>
I will take that as a compliment, perhaps. Um, there is a, uh, been a proliferation, an exciting proliferation for many people of news providers in this country. There's one particular channel, GB News, that many politicians are concerned about. Other politicians are taking money from to present shows. There are four active Conservative politicians hosting shows on GB News. And the former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is also soon joining their ranks. Now, you don't have to be a brain of Britain to work out that that channel has a clear political leaning. Is that fair? They have to abide by the rules of impartiality, due impartiality, fairness, accuracy, and so on. As do, two, we, I think we regulate or we license something like 2,000 broadcasters. The rules of GB News are the same as they are for this programme, for the BBC, for everybody. But the question is, I have, to, is whether I have the to be, rules I have to be a little bit careful here because so we've, got, we've got 14 investigations going on at the moment following complaints about GB News. So I have to be a little bit careful not to prejudice the, the outcome. But there's a question of principle, though, isn't there? Because the Ofcom rules, you say they are the same across the industry, but the industry has changed so much that some people look at it and think, well, hang on a minute, organisations like GB News are running rings around the regulator that's sticking to rules that were put in place in another I, I wouldn't recognise the phrase running rings around them. I think we've, they've been in breach, I think, about four times so far. But are you so, concerned generically, in a general sense, not just as somebody who's at Ofcom, but as one of the most successful long-time TV executives, do you have worries about an increasing level of polarization and, and commentary? I have, I have worries about, about freedom of speech and freedom of expression on the airwaves. That's what concerns Ofcom. You know, we have to balance complaints against freedom, freedom of speech. Freedom of speech means say what you like within the law and on broadcasting, licensed broadcasters, that means saying what you want within the rules that Ofcom uh, has to uphold. But do you really think with such a changed landscape, for good or ill, that having the same rules that have been in place for such a long time is the right approach? I, I think the rules have stood us in very good stead. They have, uh, they have increased the range of choice in news outlets and current affairs. I mean, GB News is, it, it calls itself GB News, but it's more of a current affairs. You know, the, there are political chat shows that, that go on, on on BBC News, which is a kind of new format. Um, we're, we want to see a plurality of choice and freedom of expression on the, on the airways. We don't want to be in the business of telling uh, broadcasters, licensees, who they can employ, who they can't employ. There are rules about elections and politicians at election time. There are very strong, clear rules. But that's not our job. Our job is to ensure within the rules, within the, the rules of due impartiality, that there's, there is plenty of choice and freedom of expression on the airwaves. That means some people will always be offended by stuff. Okay. But there's, there's no rule that says you can't be offended. Absolutely not, Michael Gray. Thank you very much for coming in this morning. We love political chat. We can never get enough of it here. Now, let's whiz back to nine o'clock. And the big and serious question that we began with this morning, after stirring up political controversy over the protests, we were discussing if Suella Braverman's comments, the Home Secretary, had made divisions worse. I think there have been concerns sometimes that people um, have felt at liberty, let, let me just finish this one thought if I may, at liberty, uh, perhaps because they haven't seen swift enough action to carry on going out, carrying these banners, singing these, these chants and breaking uh, laws which were in place but to I'm prevent a... racial hatred. Nadine Doris, you were the Cabinet Minister who was at the beginning of the online safety bill that we were just beginning uh, to talking about there with Michael Grade. Are you happy with where it's ended up? No, I'm not. And you know that video which you um, showed at the beginning of your interview, actually the, the fundamental issue with that, with that video was misogyny. And I'm afraid misogyny is no longer covered in the mm -hmm. bill. Mm -hmm. It has been watered down to the point where vulnerable adults, young vulnerable adults and teenagers will be subjected to those very harmful mm -hmm. algorithms that you spoke about, which will direct them towards very harmful places in the internet, suicide chat rooms, eating disorder chat rooms, mm -hmm. the, those very harms that we know are resulting in a rise in suicides mm -hmm. among the 16 to 24 age group, in the massive rise we've seen in young, young girls with eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid the bill, and I just want to say actually while I'm here, you know, I did take the bill into a good place, 
there were people working on that, like Dame Caroline Dynage before me, mm -hmm. against you know fierce opposition within the department. We did get it to a good place. It was a big, it was a big and noisy debate, and I know we'll come back to these issues in the show in the months to come. Um, Shami, we asked Yvette Cooper there about the quote that you mentioned, that briefing from a senior Labour source. Labour has clarified that that off-the-record quote did not come from the leader's office. But were you happy? with what Yvette Cooper said about that. Well, I'm glad that she said it was, a, I mean, she was very clear that it was offence and, and condemned it. And, and condemned it. That's very important um, leadership from her as the, as the Shadow Home Secretary. I mean, the murky world of off the record briefings, you know, as I say, Nadine uh, wrote a book about it. And, and by the way, after that excellent interview with, um, with Lord Grade, we need to remember that Nadine also exposed in her book that when she appointed him or she recommended his appointment to the then Prime Minister Boris Johnson, Johnson, um, shadowy forces, shadowy forces and sources actually tried to change the recommendation on the on the submission to the Prime Minister. Well, I didn't think at the beginning of this morning that we'd find so many common causes <laughs> between Shami <laughs> Chakrabarti and Nadine Doris. You never quite on know what you're going Sunday, to what you're going all to get. These things are possible. Well, women can, people we'll can speak all in the trenches across the, together. Across the political divides. Um, Kim Zarek, I just wonder. I know in the end, you know, your 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 career was victim in some ways of a big leak. What do you think of all this kind of stuff? Um, I speak only from very general knowledge of all of this, <laughs> I promise you. But I do think that the, uh, the, the platform, the big platforms, need very strong regulation, very tough regulation. And from what Nadine has said, I wonder if this bill, which I haven't followed in detail, has been watered down too much. And I do think that they can afford it. You know, they're, the they're making vast sums of money. So yeah. hiring the people to uh, police the internet properly seems to me... Uh, Thing we can we can reasonably ask of them. Okay, well, all three of you, thank you so much. We've covered huge amounts of ground on a very busy day. We'll see what happens in the coming days to Soella Braverman. We'll see also look out for the judgment from the courts on Wednesday when the government will be told whether or not flights to deport migrants to Rwanda, Soella Braverman's dream, can come true. By the time we meet again next Sunday, there might be a new reshuffled cabinet. Rishi Sunak might have tried to grab back the initiative and send Soella Braverman packing. Or maybe the Prime Minister's natural caution might actually leave her in place. We will see. Either way, the perhaps unnecessary political furore of the serious questions around the protests may have dented Downing Street's authority again. And with the polls where they are, they can ill afford that. In a second here on BBC One, there'll be live coverage of our service of national remembrance. Later, I'll be heading to the weekend edition of Newscast. That'll be on BBC Sounds later. But you all know, every now and then, on a special occasion, we like to bring you something that isn't politics. It's just indescribably gorgeous and goes beyond words. Today, it is the turn of musician Vikinger Olufsen, who's recently recorded Bach's Goldberg Variations. You will know them when you hear them. He's recorded them to huge acclaim. So we asked him to be play the beginning of that incredible work on this important day, just for you. It is beautiful. So until next week, we wish you a very goodbye.